This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Need to Hone, and it's Wednesday, and that means it's time for another deck history, the series where I trace the development of prominent magic deck archetypes from their beginning all the way to the current day. Before we jump into the video, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is now Need to Hone merch. Follow the link in the description and you can buy a shirt featuring the new logo. You can also become a channel member if you want to support the channel that way. All right, let's get back to the video. As usual, I ran a poll last week to let the viewers decide the topic of this video. I gave viewers an option between two different tribal decks, Merfolk and Spirits, and in the end, Merfolk won pretty easily. Like all tribal decks, Merfolk decks are filled with creatures with that creature type, and lots of payoffs for having a whole bunch of creatures with that same creature type. Merfolk decks were actually the very first tribal decks to find success at Magic's highest level of competition, and they've been relevant in every single format at one time or another over the last quarter century. So, not only are they the very first tribal deck of all time, there's also a pretty good argument that Merfolk decks are the best tribal decks of all time. They have just been more consistently successful than any other tribe in the game's history. This all means, of course, that Merfolk decks occupy an important and prominent place in Magic's history. At one time or another, Merfolk decks have been successful in block, standard, extended, modern, legacy, and vintage, and in this video we'll look at Merfolk decks in each of these formats and look at how and why they've changed over time. As you've probably already noticed from the runtime, this is an extra long edition of deck history. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Before we talk about the very first Merfolk deck, which arrived on the scene in 1998, I want to talk a little bit about Merfolk prehistory, or in other words, support for Merfolk decks before 1998. From the very beginning, Merfolk decks received tribal support. They were one of three creature types, along with zombies and goblins, to receive a lord in Magic's original set, Alpha. Lord of Atlantis is the strongest of those three lords as it only costs two mana and offers a substantial buff in the form of plus one plus one and island walk to all Merfolk. Lord of Atlantis is a card we're going to see a whole lot of in this video, but it being printed in 1993 did not immediately lead to Merfolk being successful. Following this, Merfolk received some more tribal support in 1994's Fallen Empires in the form of Vidalian War Machine, but this card was pretty bad. So yeah, believe it or not, at the time the first Merfolk deck emerged, there were only two payoffs that Merfolk decks had access to, and with Vidalian War Machine being a mediocre card, that pretty much meant that the earliest Merfolk decks relied on Lord of Atlantis. Atlantis. We're going to start off with Extended, because that's the first format where we saw a Merfolk deck find success. Extended is a now-defunct rotating format that featured the last several years of sets. It was sort of like a larger standard format. At 1998's Pro Tour Paris, Nicolas Labar finished in second place with his Mono Blue Fish deck. By today's standards, this deck doesn't actually have that much of a tribal theme. It, of course, features Lord of Atlantis, but yeah, the deck lacks any other merfolk payoffs, which, like we saw, is because Lord of Atlantis was pretty much all there was at the time. The deck even runs several creatures who aren't merfolk. Amazingly enough, Lord of Atlantis is going to appear in almost every single deck that appears in this video, and he's played in every merfolk deck in which he is legal. And that's always been true, dating back to this very first deck in 1998. You can also see that the deck runs a pretty hefty suite of counter magic with four counter spells, two force spikes, and four force of wills. This deck was really formulated in response to busted combo decks in Extended at the time, which included decks making ridiculous amounts of mana with Talarian Academy and High Tide. This Merfolk deck was really well positioned to combat this. First, it was pretty aggressive, something those decks could struggle with. Island Walk was also really good against both of them, since the creatures would frequently be unblockable, and once it had established itself on the board, it could use its suite of counter magic to disrupt any sort of combo nonsense the opponent might be trying to pull off. Basically, it's a mono blue tempo deck. So, Nicolas's deck was a great metagame call as evidenced by its second place finish. This would really set a precedent for Merfolk decks, which over the next quarter century would find a lot more success, and usually with a similar game plan that involved utilizing Merfolk lords, aggressive creatures, and blue interaction. This would be the only top 8 for a Merfolk deck in Extended for quite some time, but we will return to the format later on in this video. For now, let's move to Standard, which would be the next format to feature a prominent Merfolk deck. 
At the 2001 World Championship, two Merfolk opposition decks finished in the top eight. While Merfolk still really only had access to one good Merfolk payoff in the form of Lord of Atlantis, the Lord alone was powerful enough to make this deck successful. This version of Merfolk leaned harder into the creature type, with every creature in the deck a Merfolk this time, and it was also much more of a prison deck, utilizing both opposition and static orb. You would play a bunch of cheap Merfolk and then use them to tap down all the opponent's stuff, including their lands, then static orb would make sure they never really find a way out of the lock while the deck featured various ways to get around it. Unsurprisingly, the deck also runs counter magic in the form of counterspell and thwart, and a powerful card draw spell in gush. Gush and Thwart were really good in this deck. They were both already fairly powerful cards, but the fact you could return lands to your hand and not pay mana for them was incredible. Static Orb would often limit how much mana you had, so free spells were great, and because they returned lands to your hand, this meant you could replay them and they would be untapped when you did. Merfolk Opposition decks were one of the best decks in the standard of 2001, but they didn't change a whole lot over the course of the next year, and then some key pieces rotated out at the end of the year, putting an end to the deck in the format. After that, it was about seven years before another Merfolk deck would become relevant at Magic's highest level of competition. That next deck would also come in standard, and that was Jan Roos's Merfolk deck, which he top aided Pro Tour Hollywood with in 2008. After almost 14 years of Merfolk receiving limited tribal support, Merfolk suddenly had an incredible amount of it as a result of Lorwyn Block, several sets that featured tribal as its primary theme, with Merfolk occupying the blue-white color pair. As you can see, Jan's deck is a blue-white Merfolk deck, and it's loaded up with powerful Merfolk. Lord of Atlantis was now joined by fellow Merfolk Lord, Mero Regery, which also came with the upside of allowing you to tap or untap permanents anytime you played a Merfolk, something that is pretty useful when you're trying to attack your opponent. The deck's other major Merfolk payoffs were Silver Gill Adept, which was almost always a 2-mana two 2-1 two that drew you a card when it enters the battlefield, Sig River Guide, who could give protection to Merfolk, and Stony Brook Banneret, which reduced the cost of your Merfolk spells. The deck also got to use Wanderwine Hub to shore up its mana, since it almost always injured untapped in the deck. As was still typical for Merfolk decks, it also runs some significant disruption. Curse Catcher gave the deck a Merfolk that could counter spells, and Cryptic Command and Sage's Dowsing also provided the deck with powerful counter magic. Merfolk decks would continue to find success throughout 2008, energized by all the new cards from Lorwyn Block. Later in 2008, another Merfolk variant emerged in Standard. This version of the deck didn't use white at all, and instead it went with green as its secondary color. This allowed the deck to run the powerful Changeling, Chameleon Colossus, who would count as a Merfolk for all of your payoffs, while also giving you a massive creature with protection from one of the most played colors in the format. It also allowed the deck to play Tarmogoyf, a famously powerful two-drop that would get huge in a hurry. 2008 was the last time a Merfolk deck was really successful in Standard, but that's okay because we still have plenty more formats to talk about. Let's take a look now at Block Constructed next. Block, like Extended, is a defunct format, one which featured only cards from a single block, which in this case meant four sets. It should come as no surprise that Merfolk were successful in Lorwyn Block Constructed, given the ample support they were given in those sets. Kenny Caster top aided Grand Prix Denver in 2008 with his Merfolk deck, one which went with four colors. This was something that was pretty doable in the format thanks to the cycle of Vivid Lands. As you can see, his deck doesn't feature a whole lot that we haven't already seen, but there are a couple of cards I want to take a look at, Crib Swap and Nameless Inversion. Both of these cards have the tribal super type, and they are also both changelings, which means they have the Merfolk type. Tribal is a super type that is now retired, but what it means is that these cards have a creature type associated with them, despite not being creatures. They are changelings like Chameleon Colossus, and that means they are affected by the deck's various Merfolk payoffs, and that's pretty sweet. While Merfolk decks were somewhat successful in Lorwyn Block Constructed, they weren't quite as powerful as Fairy decks were in the format, and that definitely became the dominant blue deck of that format, limiting how successful Merfolk decks could be there. Now, let's move back to Extended, where we would see another Merfolk deck in 2010. That year, Marine Liber finished in the top eight of Pro Tour Amsterdam with a blue-white version of Merfolk. By then, two new Merfolk Lords had been added to the mix. One of these was Merfolk Sovereign, who gave the usual plus one plus one to your whole board, and it could also make Merfolk unblockable. The other was Coral Helm Commander, a level-up creature who could eventually buff all of your Merfolk, and before it got to that point, it offered a reasonably efficient creature with the important creature type. One really important innovation in this extended version of Merfolk was the use of Spreading Seed. This aura allowed you to turn one of your opponent's lands into an island, and it also replaced itself. 
Making an opposing land into an island often meant that it was much less useful for your opponent, and it also meant that the island walk granted by your Lord of Atlantis would be active. So it simultaneously disrupted the opponent and allowed you to hit your opponent a lot more effectively. Merfolk decks continued to find some modest success in Extended, but then the format came to an end in 2011, and obviously, so too did Extended Merfolk decks. Extended was replaced by Modern in 2011, and that format would also prove to be a good environment for Merfolk. In 2012, at Pro Tour return to Ravnica, Satoshi Yamaguchi finished in the top 16 with his Merfolk deck. This version was mono blue, and by this point, Merfolk had received yet another Lord in the form of Master of the Pearl Trident, who was effectively four additional copies of Lord of Atlantis. The only difference between the two is that the Master's effect isn't symmetrical, while the original Lord's effect is. So the deck featured 16 copies of Merfolk Lords for each of Coral Helm Commander, Lord of Atlantis, Master of the Pearl Trident, and Marrow Regery. On top of that, the deck also used Phantasmal Image, which was typically used to copy one of those mini Merfolk Lords, so the deck plays more like it has 20 of them. In fact, the only Merfolk in the deck that isn't a Lord is Silvergill Adept. One of the things that has really propelled Merfolk to significant success over the years is the fact that it has access to so many good Lords. I mean, this deck didn't even find room for Merfolk Sovereign, so it doesn't even have every Merfolk Lord in it. The deck also made use of the powerful Aether Vial, which could allow you to get Merfolk out even faster. You only ever pay a single mana for it, and it would allow you to put creatures into play from your hand throughout the game, giving you back way more than one mana. On top of that, you could do it at instant speed, which often meant you could buff your whole board out of nowhere. Merfolk decks continued to be successful in Modern over the next few years, but the deck didn't undergo another significant change until 2015, when John Payton top-aided Grand Prix Omaha. While many of the usual suspects are featured in this deck, there was one relatively new creature added to the mix, Master of Waves. The Master wasn't a merfolk lord, but it did allow you to go super wide. After all, many of the creatures in the deck have two blue mana symbols in their cost, which means you're going to get a whole lot of elementals when you cast Master of Waves in a merfolk deck. Let's move ahead now to 2017 when Jonathan Zakchek top aided Grand Prix Vancouver. You may actually know Jonathan, by the way, as he's better known on YouTube as Nikachu, and if you don't know his YouTube channel, I highly recommend it. Anyway, by 2017, you can see there are a few differences in the deck. The biggest is probably the complete lack of non-curse catcher counter magic, something that was featured to some degree in pretty much all the Merfolk decks before this. The deck's only instants and sorceries are three copies of Dismember, which is a nice inclusion since it gave a mono blue deck a powerful removal spell. This allows the deck to be jam-packed with even more Merfolk. The deck featured a few other Merfolk we haven't seen yet. One of them is Harbinger of the Tides, a Merfolk that returns a tapped creature to its owner's hand, and one that you can give Flash by paying two extra mana. If you can combine it with Aether Vial, it can be particularly spicy because you don't have to pay that extra two mana to get the effect at instant speed. Jonathan's deck also features featured a main deck Tidebinder Mage, which has stuff to tap down in most matchups. After this, Modern Merfolk did not undergo another significant change until 2019. At this point, Merfolk decks moved back towards a blue-white build. The main reason for this was Modern Horizon's Unsettled Mariner, a changeling that made it harder for your opponent to target your creatures with spells or abilities, and that could allow you to continue to build out your board and kill your opponent. Dominaria's Merfolk Trickster and Ikoria's Benthic Biomancer were also added to this deck, which opted to run these creatures with value abilities, overrunning even more Merfolk Lords. The Trickster can tap things down while also allowing you to make a creature lose all of its abilities, which can be quite powerful. The Biomancer, meanwhile, can adapt and loot. Some variants of the deck also ran green as a second color to gain access to some of the Merfolk payoffs from Ixalan block, where Merfolk occupied the blue-green color pair. Nikachu piloted one of these blue-green variants of the deck to a top 8 finish in a modern challenge in 2020. Adding green to the deck meant you could run Kumena's Speaker and Merfolk Mistbinder. The Speaker was usually a 1-mana 2-2 in the deck, and the Mistbinder gave you another 2-mana Merfolk Lord. While this variant didn't really catch on as the dominant form of Merfolk in modern, it did find some modest success in the format. Let's fast forward now to the very recent past and look at the most recent Merfolk deck to do well at an event. At DreamHack Dallas in June of 2022, Thomas Shelton finished in the top 16 with his version of Merfolk. While we're not seeing anything wildly different from what we've already seen, there is one really big addition. Modern Horizon 2's Zvaloon of Sea and Sky. Zvaloon is a merfolk god that gets indestructible if you control two other merfolks, draws you a card when it attacks, and gives all of your merfolk ward one. 
Oh, and on top of that, it's a 3-mana three 3-4. Three, Obviously, this is a big upgrade for the deck. Modern Horizons 2 also gave Merfolk decks Tide Shaper, which gives you another way to turn a land into an island, which is pretty nice, since if you kick it, it is also a 2-mana two 2-2. Two, two. This lets you add to the board while also disrupting their mana, and that's definitely something Merfolk decks are interested in. So, Merfolk decks are still a thing in Modern right now, even if they aren't finding super consistent success. We've already covered a fair bit in this video, but believe it or not, we still have two more formats to talk about, Legacy and Vintage. Let's take a look at Legacy next, which is the format where Merfolk decks have had the most significant and consistent success over the last 12 years. Let's rewind to 2010, when Merfolk decks first emerged as a prominent player in the format. At Grand Prix Columbus in 2010, Tomohoru Saito became the first player to top 8 a major event with a Merfolk deck. His deck doesn't feature a whole lot we haven't already seen, but there is one big addition, Standstill. Standstill is an enchantment that pops any time a player casts a spell, and the opponent of the player who cast that spell gets to draw three cards. The game plan of this Merfolk deck was to get on the ground quickly and force the opponent to have some sort of answer. If you could put Standstill in play while you were ahead on board, you would put your opponent in a horrible position. They had to answer your aggression, and when they did, they reloaded your hand. Over the next few years, Merfolk decks and Legacy pretty much always looked like this, although the standstill angle wasn't featured in every version of the deck. However, by 2014, there was one very important addition to the deck. And that was True Name Nemesis, which was printed in Commander 2013. We didn't see the card when we talked about Modern, and that's because Commander sets are only legal in the Eternal formats. The Nemesis is an incredibly good creature. While a 3-mana three 3-1 three isn't exciting, the fact that it has protection from a player is a huge deal, as it really limits the ways in which your opponent can interact with it. It can't be blocked, it can't be targeted, it can't be damaged, and it can't be enchanted. This means that only Edict effects and board sweepers that don't do damage can take it down, and because the deck is loaded up with a bunch of ways to buff your merfolk and counter that sort of thing, the Nemesis can quickly end games. From here, it became a staple in Legacy Merfolk decks. Merfolk decks didn't change a whole lot in Legacy between 2014 and 2021, but 2021 would feature an interesting twist for Legacy Merfolk. 2020's Akoria featured Thassa's Oracle, and this led some Merfolk decks down the road of having a combo win. This version of the deck runs a lot of the creatures we've already seen, but it also includes Paradigm Shift, which you can use to shrink your library and win the game when you cast an Oracle. The deck's game plan is still pretty aggressive, but the combo gives the deck another axis to operate on, which is pretty nice. If an opponent stabilizes against you, you still have this combo as an out. Hull Breacher from Commander Legends was another new Merfolk featured in the deck. It keeps the opponent from drawing extra cards and generates treasure for you. Merfolk decks haven't been quite as consistent in Legacy over the last year or so, but they are still a real deck in the format. Now, let's take a look at the last format to be featured in this video, Vintage. In 2013, Joel Lim became the first player to take a Merfolk deck to a top 8 at a major Vintage event. His deck featured a whole bunch of Merfolk we've already seen, and in a lot of ways it's just a Vintage port of those decks. Sure, it features some of the Power 9 and has access to some of the best counter magic in the game, but the game plan doesn't deviate much from what we've seen so far. Basically, playing Merfolk in Vintage gives you access to powerful tribal synergies, and you still get to play a powerful blue card like Force of Will, and that's pretty nice. Even if we fast forward all the way to 2021, we see a deck with creatures very similar to those that appear in Legacy, and most of them are in modern Merfolk too. So, that's the history of Merfolk decks. They were the first tribal deck ever, and arguably the most successful tribal deck of all time, with significant success in virtually every one of the formats in the game. So far, Pioneer and Historic haven't had successful Merfolk decks, but it's hard to count Merfolk out entirely in any format, with the kind of track record they have in all the other formats. If you enjoyed this video, please do me a favor and like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on the 39 other episodes of Deck History, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can do that in a whole bunch of ways, including Patreon, YouTube membership, Twitch subscription, or by buying merch. And you can find links to all of those things in the description. Thanks for watching.